So the purpose of what I'm going to talk about is really to start bridging the gap. The gap between what Nilofa was discussing before lunch, which is conceptually, we've got a problem, how might we split it up to create all these different parallel tasks? And on the other side of things, which Adrian was talking about, which was the hardware itself. So how do we bridge this gap? How do we write parallel codes? And starting to think about this, we can actually take advantage of two of the technologies or two of the work units, I think Adrian referred to them as, one called threads and one called processes. Now, as Adrian mentioned, threads share memory and processes share absolutely nothing. So we're going to talk in detail about utilising these and the very significant differences between writing parallel codes in this way. And then lastly, we're going to talk about some practicalities of using these on a machine like Archer. So first of all then, I'm going to talk about shared variable parallelism, which is based upon threads. And the easiest way to explain this is with an analogy. Before we come to this, um, just very quickly, just to look again at a slide that Adrian had in his, um, his slide deck, what we've got here is a single process that creates two threads. And we've got a whole load of data that we want to work on. So for instance, here we've got eight pieces of data from A0 to A7. So a process creates two threads, and then potentially thread zero can work on this data here, and thread one can work on this data here. So thread zero doing A0, A1, A2, A3, and thread one doing A4, A5, A6, A7. And on a machine like Archer, we could put these threads on different cores and hopefully get a nice speed up. So that's the general idea here, which we'll look at in more detail. So let's say, thinking about this, we have a, an analogy. And that is, imagine you're in an office with a single office mate. There's two of you in an office, and you're working on solving a problem together. Now, probably the most natural way of doing that, especially if you've got a big whiteboard, is both of you working on the whiteboard together. So in this analogy, you and your office mate represent threads running on a different core of Archer, and this big whiteboard represents the shared data. And actually, that's fairly easy to do. You and your office mate each have a pen, and you're each jotting away. However, you do need to put some careful consideration in to how you can work together without interfering. I suppose the most obvious thing is knocking elbows with each other, but also potentially overwriting each other's work, or if you rely on some intermediate value, that your office mate is working on, how do you know if what they've written is the value you need, or they're going to further update it before you can get access to that? So with this approach of shared variable parallelism with threads, by default, everything is shared. Everything is in the shared memory. But what we can also do is explicitly make certain things private. So with my analogy here, maybe it's a little bit the corner of the whiteboard that your office mate can't see, and equally, they've got a little bit of a corner that you can't see. Or equally, maybe you've got a notepad and your office mate has a separate notepad. And potentially, you're working on this notepad and then just publishing some data into the shared memory. And potentially, that's one way of collaborating without interfering. But by default, everything is shared and we need to make explicit things private. So it looks something like this as far as the threads are concerned. So here we have three threads. Each has access to this big shared data. And each has a little bit of its own private data, where explicitly it can put certain things in. Now what this PC here represents is what's called the program counter. And each thread has its own what's called program counter, i.e. its own location, its own point in the executable. So one thread could very well be up here. One thread could be down here. One thread could be over here, doing a different task. That's absolutely fine. They can be at different points in the execution of, um, of the code without any explicit management of them. And we're going to come on to that in a few moments' time. So I've got an illustration. I've got an example. Now, we've got two variables here. We've got A, which is a normal variable by default in shared data. And we've also got my A that we've explicitly set to be in threads private data. So each thread has its own explicit copy of my A, and there's just one copy of A 
overall in the shared data. So third one says my A is equal to 23, and this is written into its own private data, and then it says A is equal to my A, which pops this into the, the shared data. Thread two says my A is equal to A plus one, and then pops this into, again, its own private data. So thread two could not see thread one's my A, and thread one could not see thread two's my A, because explicitly, as I say, these have been made private, but they can both see this A variable, which is just in the shared data. And this is how they're working together. This is how they're interacting with the shared data, this A variable, in this big area of memory, like so. Now, now one thing that's very important to say about this is temporally, it's really critical that thread 2 executes its code after thread 1 in this example. Because imagine, if thread 2 was to execute this line before thread 1 had written this result in, the value in here would be gibberish. It wouldn't have been set. And that's one of the, um, one of the big aspects about these, um, about these threaded programs. You need to carefully think about the ordering of data and the ordering of threads. Because if one thread needs to read some shared data that's being written into by another thread, you need to make sure that that data is there, i.e. thread 2 hasn't raced ahead and um, isn't reading in a value that hasn't been set by this point. But with this approach, as I say, data's being shared, data's being accessed by simple variable accesses, like so. It's very common if you've done some programming before with the shared data. Now I'd say synchronization is absolutely crucial here. So thread 2 must execute its code after thread 1 to get the correct results. And most commonly use what's called a global barrier synchronization, but there are other options available which can give you more performance, but are more complicated and beyond the scope of this course. Now actually physically writing the parallel codes is fairly straightforward, because it's literally just accessing variables um, like normal code. However, getting the correct results can often require much more thinking because you've got these ordering constraints, because you've got to make sure that these threads are not conflicting with the shared data. And one of the challenges can be that you might write a code, it might not be quite correct, maybe there's this conflict you haven't realised, it doesn't produce an error, it just runs, but the output it produces is wrong. Or alternatively, especially with more complicated codes, especially when you optimise them further, nine times out of ten, it works absolutely fine. But there's some edge case, that one times out of ten, this thread is slightly further ahead for some reason, and you get an error, as in the data's incorrect. And then you've got to scratch your head and try and figure out what you've not put in, what safety you haven't put in, what locking you haven't put in, to account for this edge case. So from my own personal experience, as I say, I can tell you that sometimes this can be quite a headache. You've got code that works, but this very small number of times you're getting incorrect results because of something you haven't realised or haven't addressed in terms of the safety. So I've got a specific example here. Now what we have are eight numbers and we want to add them together with two threads. So in our shared data area, everything by default is shared, remember, we have my array a with all these starting numbers and then the final result that we're going to eventually write into. Now each thread explicitly makes a number of variables private, i.e. has its own private copy of a number of variables. Firstly, a loop counter. Secondly, where to start from in this array. Thirdly, where to stop. And lastly, its own local sum. So what will happen here is thread one would start at element zero and loop to element three. Thread one would start from element four and loop to element seven each updating their own private value of my A sum. Now once they've done that, what we need to be really careful of is when we write to this shared A sum at the end, that this is done by one thread at a time. And the reason for that is if both threads were to write their value of my A sum at the same point, the bits that make up the number could very easily conflict, and again we'd get gibberish. So this is what's called the critical region. And the reason we call it a critical region is it's critically important that only one thread is in here 
at any one time, i.e. thread zero and then thread one. And in this code, it could be in any order, so it could be thread one and then thread zero. But we want to make sure in this critical region, we've only got one thread at a time, right into this value. And I mean, generally speaking, what we want to do is try and minimize the size of these critical regions so each thread can be running concurrently for as much as possible. And then the critical regions to be as small as possible to, um, in order to maximize our parallelism. And if you've done some threaded programming before, you might uh, recognize the terms of some mutex. That's a very common approach, a very common way of protecting access to these critical regions. So in terms of the hardware, and Adrian's talked about this already a little bit in his talk earlier on, to support shared variable parallelism, to support threaded parallelism, what we need to have is one shared memory area. So the process is connected to one shared memory area. And in our example with Archer, that is a node. So we've got two processes in a node, each with 12 cores, connected to this shared memory. It's also important as well, and again, Adrian talked about this a little bit earlier on, that there's a single operating system managing this, because the operating system manages the threads and manages how the threads are working. So in order to adopt this approach, you need to be within the single memory area, within the single operating system, which is a node of Archer. I say Adrian mentioned this earlier on before. So what happens is, as users, we create a whole load of threads and then hand them off to the operating system and ask the operating system to then map them to cores and then execute. Now, Adrian again mentioned earlier on, still my thunder, <laughs> that HPC machines are quite significantly different than laptops or maybe a desktop or maybe even a, a web server. In terms of with these more general machines, what the computer expects, what the operating expect, system expects, is for a whole load of stuff to be running and really for performance not to be the primary consideration. Instead, for this interaction and this um, interactive response. So with this more general hardware, what the operating system would generally do is you get these threads, one to eight, and it would send them wherever it likes, wherever it thinks is best, like so. And in these general operating systems, in general computing, you actually have very little control about this placement because the operating system thinks it knows best and is doing what it thinks is going to work best for you and for this general computing. Also in these systems, what they do, so general computing systems like a laptop or like a desktop, is threads can be moved around like so. So a thread can be running and then it can be moved onto a different computing core. Now, in HPC, we don't want either of these. In HPC, what we want is one thread per core, and ideally to map that if you can, and also we don't want threads to be moved. Because imagine we've got this critical section, everybody's waiting for this thread to get through, and then another thread can go in, but certainly we've got to wait for absolutely ages because the operating system decides to move it. We don't want that. So, as Adrian was talking about, the specific modifications, specific um, updates to the operating system that are made for HPC machines to better suit our needs. So this is really what I was just saying. Threads actually existed well before parallel computers, existed for concurrency. So if you do, I don't know, if you do online banking, for instance, the banking server will have a whole load of threads that is then um, honouring all these different people in the world that's doing their online banking with them. And these threads are scheduled in with a bit of processor time and then deselected. Get another one scheduled in and deselected as they're needed. In HPC, completely different. Instead, we want one thread per core and we want that thread to run all the time for the entire job. So we don't want that thread to be selected in and selected out. We want it just to be running constantly on that core. So what the operating system tends to do, again has been mentioned, it allows you to have much more control about where threads are placed and it also stops them from moving around as well. So, as we said, threading can only operate within a single node of Archer. 
So 24 cores, because you need this single memory area, you need this single operating system. And in terms of the different patterns, the different ways in which your problem can be split up that Neil Lofer was talking about, this tends to map really quite well to loop-based parallelism, actually showed you uh, earlier on, and also some simple geometric decomposition. And with the image sharpening example, we had an OpenMP version, which is threading implemented. So it's a version of that which uses threading. But it won't scale beyond a single node of Archer, because we need to be in this shared memory space. So this supports simple parallelism, so by using either simple parallel codes, or alternatively what we can do is we could have a load of nodes per Archer, but each node running a process with a whole load of threads that's independent from any other node. And I'll give you a concrete example of that. Really the first thing we talked about this morning was dinosaur racing. And what these guys do when they're simulating the dinosaurs, you can imagine all the different joints. So a joint there, a joint there, a joint there, a joint there. These can be done in parallel, and these can represent a thread. So in a node of Archer, each joint could be mapped to a thread, mapped to a core. What they also do at a much higher level, though, is they really vary quite significantly the configuration of these joints, the configuration of the limbs and the muscles to create a whole load of hypothetical dinosaurs. One run over there, one run over there, one run over there, one run over there. Entirely separate, don't interact at all whilst they're running, but at the end, they get a whole load of data, a whole load of videos. The vast majority of the dinosaurs fall over, fall backwards. Okay, that wasn't how they moved. But a few actually did work. Right, now we can look at that and we can investigate that further. So that's one example of where you can use threading and then also use multiple nodes without them interacting like so. More complicated than that, we can combine threading also with passing messages. I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail later on. So what we could do is we could have a node of Archer with 24 threads, another node of Archer with 24 threads, and the processes themselves passing messages. Um, and also what we can do on Archer is we can, within a node, run one process with 24 threads, or we could do two processes with 12 threads within the node, or we could do four processes with six threads, et cetera, et cetera. It's entirely up to us how we want to do this. So in summary, by default, threads share everything, and we need to explicitly make things private to get our own private copy of data of variables. And this blackboard analogy is quite a good analogy for it. Um, you can't go beyond this shared memory space, beyond the single control of the operating system, and it's pretty easy to get going with writing these codes because it's just variable access. But it requires a bit more thought in terms of the safety, in terms of the correctness and consistency of this um, with locking data and making sure that data is consistent. There's a whole load of different technologies that support threading. In HPC, the most common one is OpenMP. And again, this image sharpening example, we have an OpenMP version of it. So you're welcome to have a look and have a play with that. Um, also, we're going to talk about OpenMP in a little bit more detail tomorrow as well. So that's threads. As I say, everything by default is shared. The opposite of that, the converse, are processes. And as Adrian has said, processes share nothing. They're ring-fenced and they can't share any memory at all. So in order for processes to work together and communicate, we need to pass explicit messages between them instead. So again, I'm going to go back to my analogy of a whiteboard. So instead of being in a two-person office, we're in our single-person office. And you're collaborating either with somebody next door, somebody further down the corridor, somebody in the next building, hey, maybe in a different city or even a different country. And you've each got your own whiteboard, which represents your own distributed memory, but there's no way that the other person can see that. So instead, to share data, to share variables, to share values, what you need to do is pass explicit messages from yourself to this other person, potentially uh, by the telephone. That's probably a good, a good analogy for this. Picking up the phone and phoning them and telling them a number. So it's a very different way of looking at this. So again, I've got an example of this. So now the memory areas are completely distinct, potentially on different nodes of Archer. 
and we say on process one, A is equal to 23, and this gets written into here. And then on process two, it issues this receive call saying, OK, I want to receive a value from process one, and we'll call that B. Now, the simplest version of this, and what we're going to start with, these are blocking or synchronous calls. In terms of, you issue the call, and the process waits there. And it waits, and waits, and waits, and waits, until it receives that data from the uh, matching process from process one. Process one continues, and issues a send, and says, OK, send a message to process two, this value of A. And again, starts with synchronous communications. So this send sits there and waits, and waits, and waits, and waits, until that message is starts to be received by process two. So that gets sent. Process two receives this, and it gets written into this variable of B. So now process two can continue and execute A is equal to B plus one, like so. So you can see this looks actually very different from the previous version, from the threaded version, where the only way of getting this value across is this explicit message from process one to process two. Well, that's the only way of sharing data, sharing values that we're working on. Now the synchronization here is automatic. In the message passing, the messages are doing the synchronization for you. And as I say, the analogy of a phone call is probably a pretty good one, in terms of if you're making a phone call, you're on the phone and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting until the receiver picks up. The other person picks up. If you're waiting to receive a phone call, you're sitting there and you're waiting for it to ring, you're waiting for it to ring, you're waiting for it to ring. Eventually it rings, you pick it up and answer the phone. Now compared with shared variable parallelism, compared with using threads, often it's a bit more difficult to get going with this if you're not so familiar with it. It requires a bit more knowledge, a bit more thinking, it's probably a bit different from what you've done already if you've done any programming. So it can be a little bit slower to get cracking with this and writing the codes. However, on the flip side, it's often more obvious if you've made a mistake. So if there's a mistake that's going to give you a wrong result, often you get an error message. Or you get what's called deadlock. Maybe process 2 has started to receive a message, but it's never sent from process 1. So it's more obvious because that just never continues program never terminates. Again, something we've got to consider here. Um, so as I say, it's, it's often much more obvious when you've made a mistake. And unlike threading, if it does run and it does give you the wrong values, often, the vast majority of the time, they're the wrong values every single time, time after time after time after time, because you've mismatched messages or you've not sent data that you need to be sending. Unlike threading, which can often work nine times out of ten, and then just not that one time. So as I say, with this approach, it tends to be much more obvious when you've made an error, when you're explicitly passing messages. Now, what we've talked up, up, about up until this point is synchronous communications. And so a synchronous send is a process so I send a message, and it will not continue beyond that point until that data has started to be received by the receiving process. It's also possible to do asynchronous communications. So an asynchronous send will carry on, it will complete as soon as the data has left the calling process. There are also asynchronous receives, but they're a little bit less commonly used and beyond the scope of this course. So we're not going to worry about them too much. So I've got some specific examples here. You can think of a synchronous send as faxing a letter. Now, if you're a similar age to me, I don't think I've ever sent a fax. Um, but the way faxes work, I'm led to believe, is you fax a letter, you send it off, and then you actually wait until the receiving fax machine sends you an acknowledgement back, say, yep, that's fine, it starts to be received, and then what you send, you can then throw away or, or archive. And that's exactly what's happening here. The fax is being sent, and we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting to get that acknowledgement back. So we know that data has started to be received. But there's a slight issue with that, and the slight issue is, potentially, we're wasting resources. Potentially, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting for this acknowledgement, and I've got plenty of other stuff I could be getting on with, plenty of other stuff I could be doing, but I'm not, because it's taken ages for that acknowledgement to come back. And that's exactly where this asynchronous send can come in and be useful. And here we've got an analogy of posting a letter. So we've got some data, here a letter, 
you popped in the post box, so you've got rid of it, and then you really don't care about when it's going to be delivered, you've got rid of it, well, I'm going to crack on and do some other stuff. So if I'm a process, I'm going to carry on and do some more computation, do some more scientific simulation. And at some point, that data will be received. We don't know when it will be received, but at some point it will. That's fine. Now, it really depends on your application. If you need to know, if a process needs to know when a message has been received and when the receiving process has got that data, then obviously the synchronous send is the one to use. But in many applications, you can get a performance improvement by adopting this asynchronous communication, where as soon as it's gone, I just crack on. I don't really care. So what we've been talking about with this message passing up until this point are point-to-point -point communications. So we've got two processes, one sender, one receiver. And this is the simple for, simplest form of message passing. And this relies on having a send and having a receive. And if we don't have these matching calls, then we'll have deadlock. I suppose there's a close analogy here to sending a personal email. So you've got a friend or somebody you're collaborating with, you just send them an email. So you're passing a message from yourself to them. But if we think about sending emails, often we don't just send them to one person, we might send them to a whole load of other people as well. So maybe we collaborate with a, a number of people. Or maybe we send them to everybody in the building or everybody in the department. And it's exactly the same idea with message passing. As well as point-to-point -point communications, we also have collective communications. And these are messages being passed between more than two processes. And actually, we've already seen this. We've already seen this in the image sharpening example, where what I called a master process read the image in and then broadcast this out to every other process. This is an illustration of a collective communication because it's involving a whole load of processes. Now, what we could do, what we could have done instead, is a very large number of individual point-to-point -point communications. So the master could have gone, right, I'm going to send you a message, 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 this data to each of these individually. But the reason we don't do that the reason we have these explicit collective communication calls is because manufacturers like Cray really heavily optimize these in the hardware. So using these collective communication calls directly, and you'll see these in the examples, we'll talk about them in a bit more detail tomorrow, certainly those of you on the MPI course will see this in lots and lots of detail later on in the week, you get much more performance rather than using many, many individual point-to-point -point communications. So, I mean, broadcast, as I've talked about, it's like having one person sending a message to everybody else or one process sending a message to everybody else. And here we've got the master process, or often terminology-wise, we call it the root. And what it's doing is it's broadcasting this value to every other process. And in this example here, we've just got one value, but it can be any number of values. And with our image sharpening example, it was a whole load massive number of values which made up the image that we're broadcasting across. What this does though is naturally when you start thinking about this and you start thinking about parallelism, it raises a question, or it raises a question in my mind. So the way we've written the image sharpening example to keep it simple, because we have these large number of neighbours that we're working with, a broadcast is probably the right thing to use. It's probably quite natural to use. However, bear in mind each process is only working on a subset of the data. And so, in many applications, sending all the data over, and it might not need all of it, it might only need a little bit, it's probably quite wasteful. In terms of maybe you're saturating the network, the network's really busy with all this extra data, all the data going to each process, where potentially in many applications, many codes, each process only works on a small subset, and only needs that small subset of data to work with. So as well as a broadcast, another form of collective communication is what's called a scatter. And what we have here is the root, or the master, has a whole load of data, and this is then scattered out amongst the processes. So for instance here, the first value, value 0, is sent to this one, the second value, value 1, is sent to this one, 2 remains here, 3 to this one, 4 to this one, 5 to this one. And if we had 12 values of data, the first two values 
to go here, the second two values here, second two values here, next two values here, etc. If we had 60 values of data, the first 10 values would go here, the next 10 values here, etc, etc, etc. So it's splitting the data up and just sending the small subset to each process. So you very often, very commonly in many codes, see this scatter at the start of the code to distribute the data. What you also often see at the end of the code is the opposite of this, i.e. the gather, gathering up all the results back to the final big solution, final big answer. So this is the opposite of that, where each process is sending its bit of data back, which is gathered back. So here's zero sent back, it's in there, one sent back, it's in there, two's there, three's there. And for instance, if each process had 10, 10 values of data, they'd write them back to so the first 10 values from this one, the next 10 values from this one, the next 10 values from this one, the next 10 values from this one, etc, etc, etc. So as I say, that pattern of scatter at the start, do computation, gather at the end, is really quite a familiar pattern you can often see in many message passing codes. The last form of collective communication to talk about then is this idea of a reduction. So every process has a value, has its own, has its own local value, and we want to reduce these to produce one global value with some operator. So for instance here, we've got five people voting on whether to strike. So each has a local value, yes or no, and then this gets reduced to the final answer, whether to strike or not. And in our field of HPC, in message passing, what we'll often have is operations do global sums, sum all the values up, do global product to multiple, multiply the values up, to find a global maximum, global minimum, what the process is, and a number of others as well. These are the very common ones there. So here, each process is sending the root or sending the master its own value, and the operator we're using is the sum. So the 15 result value here is the result of all the individual values added together. And I'll talk very briefly about weather, which is an area I currently work with. Potentially, maybe each process is looking at some clouds and has figured out locally for its own bit of the weather, the highest point of the cloud, and then it's bringing all these values together with the maximum operator to figure out the global maximum height cloud, how high the cloud goes up to, um, potentially, um, in the entire system. So, in terms of the hardware, and again this is something Adrian's already talked about, and naturally um, processes, naturally this approach of message passing, maps to distributed memory, where we have one process per processor core, and absolutely no problem at all going over lots and lots and lots of different nodes by the network. It's absolutely no problem at all. And probably quite a few of you have already run some of these examples, some of these MPI examples on multiple nodes. Works really well with that. So, in summary, processes cannot share memory. They're entirely independent and ring fenced from each other. The analogy being separate whiteboards in different offices, apart from this ability to be able to pass explicit messages. This maps really well to what Neil Ofer was talking about in terms of geometric decomposition, the pipelines, all to this task farm as well that we've got in the fractals exercise, and the image sharpening is um, geometric decomposition as well. Again, MPI versions of these. We need explicit messages, like making a phone call or sending an email, and whilst initially it can be a little bit more difficult to get your head around this and write code in this way, require a bit more of an investment, Often, if you've made a mistake, it's more obvious. Almost exclusively, we use what's called MPI, the Message Passing Interface Library, which is the version, um, or the versions that we have um, for the message passing practicals that we provided to you. Now, just the last couple of things I want to mention on this before we carry on with the practical, is the practicalities of using processes of using message passing on a machine like Archer. What we've already mentioned is suggest one MPI process per processor core. So for instance here, I've got an eight core machine, and that's over two nodes, for instance, um, four processor cores per node. But actually, often in many cases, 
it doesn't really matter too much when we're using MPI what the specific architecture is. Actually, as far as our code is concerned, as far as us running it, maybe apart from a couple of um, options in the submission script, it won't make a huge difference whether this was one node with eight cores, <coughs> two nodes with four cores, or even eight nodes with one core each. It's just one, um, one MPI process per processor core. And yes, within the same node, meshes might be slightly faster, because you're not having to go out on the network. But as I say, um, from the programmer's point of view, often it doesn't make a huge, huge difference. Now, one question that we're often asked at this point is actually going back to my whiteboard analogy. And people say, OK, well, that makes sense. But running one MPI process per processor core within a node, actually, with this whiteboard analogy, seems that you have a really dysfunctional relationship with your office mate. Imagine you're working together in a two-person office on a problem. And instead of standing up on the whiteboard working together, the only way you're communicating is by picking up the phone and speaking to each other, not working directly to each other. And people say, well, surely based upon that analogy, why don't we combine the two approaches? So for instance, within a node, you could have this idea of processes, uh, message passing at the top level, and then 24 threads in that node. And then another node, a process, 24 threads. Another node, a process, 24 threads. And the processes at the node level could communicate. Now certainly you can do that, but it can actually become quite complicated from a code point of view. Because what we're doing is we're combining two approaches. We're combining this threading approach using shared variable parallelism, where by default everything is shared, with this processes and message passing approach, where by default nothing is shared. And by combining these two approaches, suddenly your code can be quite, become quite complicated. And actually, the MPI library is really, really clever. So when you run one process per core on a node, so we've got 24 processes on this node, for instance, behind the scenes, the way the MPI library implements this is effectively with shared memory, with the shared whiteboard. But from you as the programmer, you're using message passing. It looks like messages. There are messages. But the way it's implemented is with shared memory. But you don't need to worry about that because the MPI library itself is clever enough and good enough to give you that optimization and give you that performance. It's that performance improvement, sorry. So, um, so yeah, so that's why often one process per core is a good way of doing it. And what you'll have probably already seen is this AP run command that we have in the submission script. We've only scratched the surface in terms of the options that you can give to this. We've already given the dash n to talk about the number of cores. Often that relates to the number of MPI processes. But there's a whole load of other options that we have that are documented on the Archer website. And we're going to talk about these in a bit more detail as well tomorrow. So in summary, we've got two distinct approaches for exploiting parallelism. We've got threads, which are shared variables. By default, everything is shared. You explicitly make things private, so each thread has an explicit its own copy of specific data. This tends to be easy to implement, but can have limited scalability and also some difficulties with consistency sometimes. The other approach is processes which have nothing to do with each other as far as memory is concerned, and the only way they can interact is with messages. Now, the big benefit for these is they can run over many, 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 many nodes. It can be a bit harder to implement initially, especially if you're not used to it, but it can give you much better scalability, and also, if you made a mistake, often it's more obvious. OpenMP is very, very common in HPC with shared variable parallelism, and MPI with processes with this distributed memory. And that's why all the examples are in MPI or OpenMP. And certainly for those of you who are here at the end of the week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you'll be talking about MPI in lots and lots of detail then, the technicalities of it. For any of you that aren't here towards the end of the week or want to find out more about OpenMP, we're going to briefly talk about it tomorrow. There's also loads and loads of information on the Archer website. And feel free to grab us and we can point that to point you to that um, and you can have a look at that. As well as us teaching an explicit course on OpenMP as well, slightly later on in the summer. That's also very popular.